Heritage Automotive is proud to present What's Your Watermark? This more love film, inspired by the world-changing work of two of our customers, salutes Vermonters that are making a positive mark on the world of water and begs the question, what's your watermark? We've got the temperatures in the 70s, right in the Champlain Valley, 79 degrees Burlington, 75 as you head toward Plattsburgh. All right, tomorrow's going to be a big day on Lake Champlain. It's actually going to be a beautiful day. If you're going to hit the lake, it's a south wind, 5 to 10 knots, waves at about a foot. Water temperature, Lake Champlain, still very doable, above 70 degrees. If this lake turned green, if this lake dried up, it would be devastating. Ultimately, you know, we pollute the planet day in and day out, and water is the first place all the pollutants make it to. The question is, is it a priority to make sure that water is safe? Like, is that a priority? If we just don't need to be drinking bottled water, the bottle itself, where does it go when we recycle it? And that plastic doesn't just decompose. In the Caribbean and in, in the Americas, they have water, but it's contaminated. There's individual actions that we all need to take. We really need to change the habits and the culture of how we react to the Earth. There's an opportunity here. It's going to require courage, and it's going to require making what in the short term will seem like some sacrifices. I'm, I'm beyond the point of pointing fingers for the problem, and it's time to start looking for a solution. People remember when they used to drink the water from Lake Carmi and use it for intake, and now people worry about using it to bathe their children and wash their dishes. We have the tools at our disposal. We have the studies. We know what will help. It's time to get to action. Lake Carmi, once known as Silver Lake, never recovered, and the toxic blue-green algae bloom lasted until the lake froze over. We need to use Lake Carmi, sadly, as an example of what could happen on a larger scale with Lake Champlain. There's a four mile stretch along Maquam Shore in St. Albans. There are 29 properties for sale. That sends a message. This summer, Lake Champlain saw unprecedented toxic algae blooms up to 17 tributaries that feed into the Lake Champlain Basin from all angles. And you can imagine what feeds into those tributaries, streams and rivers. And what, you, what feeds into those streams and rivers are the things that we put on our driveways, on our lawn, on our fields when we're farming. It all leads into Lake Champlain. 200,000 people drink water that comes from Lake Champlain. The, the ability to have clean water is the beginning of, of health. What is surprising to me is that we continue to want to put our waste into our drinking water. The human race is in trouble. We cannot survive in a planet where we are being poisoned. And the prevention of disease begins with you know, the quality of the food you eat, the quality of the water you drink, and the quality of the environment around you. We are seeing the crumbling of our environment. People have gotten away from the respect of each other and treating the earth like family. If you take care of the earth, it'll take care of you. Everybody's contributing to the problem. It's a person that's taking up space on this earth. The challenge is to help people understand that there are ways in which they can live on the landscape that improve our water quality. I remember very vividly my, my mom and dad taking me and my sisters to a little 
town in, in the Mohawk River Valley, and there's a, there's a creek that flows in uh, to the Mohawk River there. And it drained out of uh, Johnstown and Gloversville, New York, a center of activity in the, in the tanning business. I remember going there and seeing the river running red and having my dad and mom really speak with emotion about why that was wrong. So I feel like that has infused my whole life, not letting things get worse, creating a framework where the right dialogue starts happening. There's no better example of that than the lawsuit we filed against US EPA after they approved the uh, 2002 um, pollution budget or total maximum daily load for Lake Champlain. We set a target. We're aiming to get the phosphorus into the lake down to that level. TMDL stands for total, total maximum, maximum daily load. TMDL is a very complicated label for a pollution budget, just like a, a household budget. An impaired waterway is basically any waterway that doesn't meet minimum water quality standards. Once that determination is made, then states are obligated to do TMDLs. They have to come up with a pollution budget and figure out how much reduction needs to occur across all sources to get back to clean water. Lake Champlain was determined um, back in the 90s to not be meeting the standard for phosphorus. And so as a consequence, the state was responsible for doing what's called the TMDL, setting up a set of targets for reducing pollution from the various sources. The document was subsequently approved by EPA, and Vermont turned its attention to, to implementing the Lake Champlain phosphorus TMDL. We, both before and after that action, were saying this is a huge mistake. In approximately 2008, the Conservation Law Foundation filed a lawsuit uh, against EPA and their approval of the Vermont portion of the Lake Champlain TMDL. As a consequence of that court action, EPA ended up withdrawing its approval of the TMDL. The original Lake Champlain TMDL in 2002 did a lot of good things uh, to protect water quality in our lakes and streams. Uh, it hasn't done enough to clean up Lake Champlain. The Environmental Protection Agency rejected Vermont's plan to reduce pollution in Lake Champlain. The EPA said the state has not provided adequate assurance that it can meet its goals of reducing phosphorus. On that grounds alone, Secretary Markowitz and Commissioner Mears could have pushed back on EPA, but they didn't. They, they sort of agreed that we could do better here in Vermont, and they wanted to be part of the solution. In the time since January 2011, EPA and the state have have been working cooperatively to develop a, a new pollution budget, a new TMDL for the Vermont portions of Lake Champlain. It's one of the top issues of the legislative session, new water quality standards to protect Vermont's rivers and lakes. H35 is a comprehensive piece of water quality legislation that's being considered by the legislature this session. It deals with agriculture, municipalities, state roads, town roads, forestry activities, commercial development. I think it represents an, an all-in approach. It will be a huge blow to water quality if this bill does not pass through the legislature this session. If we can't figure out how to do it on our own, if we can't figure out how to adequately fund it now, then the EPA will say, Vermont, you've failed. I do agree that it would be better for the state of Vermont to figure out how to solve this problem at the state level and through community involvement and investment rather than a top-down EPA regulatory and enforcement posture. Vermont's got to do it. What are the things that we need to do to protect our lake and to turn things around? That's a multi-decade long process. So it's, it's a mix of short-term and long-term timeframes, I think, that's involved in this plan. A lot of our streams um, and the lake bottom sediments are full of phosphorus. Uh, so we can't expect things to sort of change right overnight. So phosphorus is an element, but it's one of three elements that are critical to life on Earth. Uh, we obtain that phosphorus in the food we eat. Uh, it's necessary for us to grow, but in uh, too great a quantity or in the wrong quantity, when that phosphorus gets into the environment, uh, it can cause problems uh, such as the algal blooms that we're seeing in Lake Champlain. 
Phosphorus is, is a part of an ecosystem. It's a part even of the lake's ecosystem. It just can't manage the amount that we're currently putting in it. There are basically three sources of phosphorus that are getting to the lake. The first is runoff from development. The second is simple natural phosphorus in our soils and the erosion. And the third is the runoff from uh, manure spreading on our farms. We get a little bit of contribution from our wastewater treatment plants, but that's smaller than most people think. Let's drop in on Papa Cloud and Junior Raindrop. Junior! Get up, get up. It's time for you to visit your mother earth. The automatic cloud gates open wide and out tumble millions of earthbound raindrops. Ouch! So, Junior joins a group of other raindrops looking for excitement. The bare soil speeds them on their way. Oh well, let's leave Junior to himself for a while. Poop is poop, and it doesn't matter if it comes from a large herd or a small herd. If it lands in the water, you know, it's not a good thing. Fertilizer takes different forms. There are chemical fertilizers, which are what people might think of applying to their lawns, and then there are natural fertilizers, and manure being chief among them. You know, manure is to us farmers, it's our gold. I think the most important thing to know about preventing phosphorus is that it's attached to small particles in the soil. And it only moves when there's a when there is erosion or a soil moving off the field. It doesn't move down through the soil. Instead of the dust bowl, I mean we're having the mud bowl. I mean instead of the wind taking it, the water takes it. We don't have the biodiversity of plants. You're, you're tilling the soil, flipping it upside down, breaking down the, the aggregate, the holding capacity. You gotta look at the soil as its own organism. We believe in caring for the land. This phosphorus issue is, is to try to stop erosion. We don't want erosion. We want to keep our soil. And, and if we can learn better ways to manage, absolutely, it's, it's better for everybody. Well, I think it's um, something that's been kind of abused for lack of knowledge for generations. And they were just saying stuff uh, either down the streams or directly into the rivers, into the lake. The concern was how are we going to feed all these people in the country? In the 50s and 60s, the federal government was giving away phosphorus. The government had railroad car after railroad car of phosphorus fertilizer that came into this county and just dumped it on the farmer's doorstep. Use it any way you can. Get it on the land. Before anyone tell me all realized what the issues were, it became you know, a pretty serious problem. Farming has changed a lot in, in just my lifetime. The dairy economy is the best agricultural economy there is. Dairy farming creates year-round jobs in the economy because the money flows pretty evenly throughout the 12 months of the year. More than 90% of the dollars come from out of state into the state. There's vegetable farmers, there's crop farmers, there's beef farmers, there's hog farmers, horse farms, and many, many other forms of agriculture in the state that also contribute. In the Agency of Agriculture, we have four staff people in 2011 and now five to do the regulation of what the USDA recognizes as over 7,000 farms. That's a pretty significant under-resourced uh, capability given the magnitude of the number of farms and the significance of the problem. A wonderful thing that it's coming to the forefront and that people are talking about it and then it's something that needs to be worked on. Vermont farmers really do care. No, they don't want to screw up our, our environment because that's only going to come back to them. Have we always been doing this right? No. We want to be transparent. We want to show people what's really happening today on farms. The other issue's got to do with the national milk pricing system. It tends to keep farmers receiving too little for their milk compared to what their expenses are. Every other business can pass on their cost and just increase their product cost. Farmers don't have that ability. You know, the first thing that tends to happen is, well, add on more cows to make more milk to pay the bills. And that can become a vicious cycle. This country enjoys one of the cheapest food sources in the world. We don't want to pay farmers as much as they deserve or need. 
for their food. Implementing some practices are very costly. You can't find anyone that cares more about the environment uh, and are very conscious of wildlife uh, than farmers. By the same token, they've got to make a living. Farmers want to do the right thing. They just need the education and the support, financial support to help get it done. Without additional resources, we're going to be caught with the promises and expectations of clean water, but not the resources to get there. When things are in negative cash flow or just scraping by, yeah, sometimes the little extras you might do to protect the environment um, get put on the back burner and you're kind of in survival mode. Wonder what's happened to Junior. Just what I feared. He's formed a gang and they're whooping it up for a flash flood. Junior's getting dangerous. He's getting tougher and bolder every day. Now he's top gangster. Heading for the big time. Raging along. Waging gang war. Fast moving water in a storm is an issue regardless of phosphorus or brooks. It's just, it's bad for your infrastructure. It erodes banks, it ends up in people's backyards, it ends up in people's basements. Um, it's not good for roads, it's not good for sidewalks. In communities where you have lots of pavement, lots of driveways, lots of roofs, lots of roads, all of that rain that would otherwise be falling into the ground immediately flows into the river. It has the impact of carrying the oil and grease and metals and trash and so forth that we leave on, our, on the developed landscape. But it also has a secondary impact that when you have such a large amount of water that hits the river all at once, it causes erosion. Oftentimes the biggest impacts associated with stormwater management are, are high flows and the havoc those, that wreaks in our, our stream channels. And as we saw post-Irene, that's a substantial amount of, of sediment that carries pollution with it, nutrients like phosphorus and nitrogen that have long-term impacts on lake quality. We have some streams in Vermont that show some pretty profound impacts of, of stormwater runoff, where there's simply very little biology left in these streams because it gets washed out when it rains under the high flow conditions. But this is your typical example of an urban brook. Here's a parking lot. Here's a deep bank, lots of evidence of erosion. Goes right through people's backyards. Goes right under the street. On its way to more backyards. And then on its way to the bay. You know, what we, what we want to do is find places to um, detain or infiltrate stormwater before it gets to the brook. Definitely. Definitely. All of that infrastructure uh, that is at the core of those cities for storm runoff was built at a time when you had one pipe for sanitary waste, sewage, and for stormwater. The event that occurred was actually, it was a perfect combination of light rain and warm temps, which melted four inches of snow in about three hours. The ground is frozen, it's got nowhere to infiltrate, there it finds a pipe and, and it goes. The flip side, of the combined sewer system is that every day that there's not an overflow, the stormwater is going to the wastewater treatment plant and it's getting treated. So if you take the stormwater out and put it in a separate pipe and just put it right in the river, you're losing all the treatment benefit that's provided on all the days when there's not an overflow. Uh, the best thing that we can do is to try to keep that water from running as rapidly to the sewage treatment plant uh, or to the lake. I think there's a, a perception that stormwater is uh, a problem that's limited to our most urbanized areas. And so some of these small towns have a hard time seeing themselves as, as having stormwater concerns. And, and every one of them has not just one or two concerns, but probably 10 to 20 different problem areas. You know, the blessing of the nice historic community that we work so hard to try and preserve comes with the curse that, you know, it was developed back before the environmental rules. So we have to go back and sort of take it apart a little bit and spend the money to implement what needs to be done for water quality. We've been developing our landscape for a long time and we've been doing so without a lot of thought to what the downstream impacts of, of that development is. We're now having to backpedal and think of 
how we uh, implement new approaches to development. Of the 250 towns in Vermont, only 50 of them have sort of a paid manager. And I think until you get to that point of having a paid town manager, you're going to have a really hard time getting people to focus on stormwater. Business has to measure the investment to what the return is going to be over time. But you've got to look beyond that. You've got to look what is the return to the entire community. You can't measure that in dollars and cents if it's clean water and clean air and the, and the future of our children and our children's children, can you? Pop Cloud is pretty disgusted with man's carelessness. He knows it isn't Mother Earth's fault. She just isn't getting cooperation from enough people in the USA. We're sometimes viewed as a polluter. If we were a polluter and we were to stop what we were doing, the environment would be better off, and that's not the case. We don't think about what happens after we flush the toilet and the network of underground infrastructure that exists to support safe sanitation in our country. Before there were wastewater treatment plants, there were pipes that would take raw wastewater sewage directly to our rivers and, and send it downstream. Before 2002, when the upgrade came along, wastewater used to contribute 65% of the phosphorus loading to the lake. Vermont likes to say we've spent all this money and we're way ahead of the curve on wastewater treatment plants. We're way behind the curve in this state on wastewater treatment plants. We're not anywhere near what is being achieved, in fact, by municipalities that also have to pay the money, some of them bigger, some of them smaller, in Massachusetts and New Jersey and Rhode Island and, and New Hampshire. So the Clean Water Act um, talks about what comes out of the pipe and that when you have an impaired water like Lake Champlain, um, you've got to use the best available technology. The problem is the best available technology is really expensive. There are two different perspectives when it comes to wastewater treatment facilities. And, and frankly, there are certain locations in the lake where wastewater may play a disproportionate role in the phosphorus concentrations we're seeing. Um, but we need to be really strategic because at this point, those investments in wastewater are going to be extremely expensive and we need to make sure that that's the best use of our limited dollars. You know, if you're at 3% of the phosphorus loading yelling already, you go to two, that's great. You go to one, that's great. You go to half the cost, you know, you could send someone to the moon probably. Everybody is affected by the way watersheds are managed, and everybody ought to do something about it. It's too bad Junior didn't know his watersheds and land on a good one. Junior and all the other raindrops could be useful if they're treated right. What your water mark is the mark that you leave on the planet based on how you use water. It could be a simple step, whether it's how you're consuming water, conserving water, or whether it's global, whether it's local. Maybe it's an effort to volunteer and contribute to the cause behind water. It's thought-provoking, and hopefully it will lead to action. We have a farm community who's engaged in working with us to try to identify how do we move to that set of practices that create healthy soils, that make the best use of the nutrients, that allow the rainfall to infiltrate. I will take a well-managed farm every day of the week over strip development. I like, would like to think that in my lifetime, the farmers will be seen as a group that are actually cleaning up the lake. Our thing is education and trying to get you know, the research, the body of knowledge from the university out to the people who are in the communities. Our team has worked probably with 200 or more farms over the last three years. They're one of the ones that are on the leading edge of this. I've got a nutrient management plan. I'm trying to put on what I, what I need to grow my crops and, and stay at that. It's, it's all about allocation. Putting it in the right place at the right time in the right way. The space, this tall green grass, is part that, the, that they don't farm. Buffer strips are like sponges and if they're wide enough, they can absorb quite a bit of the nutrients that are coming off the agricultural land before it gets into the waterway or in the case of a wetland. Planting a, a cover crop to prevent soil erosion. When you grow corn, you turn the land over so it becomes just the corn and stubble and the, and the, and the dirt. With a cover crop, it becomes like a hayfield. It 
becomes completely covered. It has a grass on it for all winter, so it's absolutely helping to reduce erosion. So we're developing crop sequences. You, you want your soil covered 100% of the time, and you want to cover the soil 100%. So my best corn's been no-till. The less soil I work up, less chance that rain's going to come in and take it away. It's not loosened up. It's staying, you know, firmly intact. Tilled fields don't soak in water very well. I think we're seeing some, some real success with it. I'm trying to do more every year. You save fuel and you save equipment costs. Plants and their cycling and their photosynthesis leaves carbon in the soil. And every time you till, you lay, lay that to the sun and it just volatilizes back. Injecting liquid manure into the ground helps with odor control. It helps with runoff if you get a hard rain after you spread manure. By injecting it into the ground, it stays in the root zone where the plants need it. There's efficiencies to it, less big equipment on the road. Instead of running their heavy spreaders, they have a pipe and a pump that goes to their pit and it's hooked to the tractor. You know, cover crops and no-till and drag line, injecting manure, all these things kind of work together, but they're all, it's not the, it's not the goal. It's like throwing parts at a car when you're trying to fix it. Without plugging in a diagnostic tool and looking at the data to find out exactly what the issue is. You know, the goal is, you know, less nutrients flowing off the fields, so that's the goal. Obviously we're not farming the same way we were 50 years ago. Farmers' kids who are going away to school and coming back saying, this is a practice we need to be doing. It's pretty exciting, I think. There are farmers out there that recognize that their impact, whether positive or negative, is going to affect Lake Champlain. Come visit farms, uh, try to understand farms, try to, to, to talk to farmers and, and, and see how things work. People who are bringing awareness to urban runoff, they're the leaders. They're the ones that are connecting the dot from the homeowner to the business owner to Lake Champlain. But none of that happens without the, the person who's building this public works project thinking about stormwater management and sort of integrating it into their thinking. There are watershed groups throughout the state that do great work sort of advocating for, the, for clean water uh, and to support the, those local on the ground efforts is, is really critical. Friends of Northern Lake Champlain has been doing terrific work with communities across this region to look at better stormwater planning, to identify where the most strategic opportunities and put a new stormwater management feature. One was a step pool drainage system that drains about 11 acres of impervious surface, which allows the water to settle out in these basins um, as it makes its way down the hill. The Swanton Public Works Director came to the Friends of Northern Lake Champlain with a, an idea. He, he knew he wanted to put a traffic calming measure in and was sure there was something he could do to improve stormwater management. We created um, a kind of a rock-lined sedimentation pond. We were able to direct a stormwater runoff from an acre of impervious surface to this fairly small traffic island with confidence that it will soak away. We had put two pervious sidewalks in Taylor Park. That's a concrete that when you put it down it has holes in it so the water goes right into the ground instead of just flowing on the sidewalk somewhere else. And then we've also put in some more stormwater planters. And they take water from the street during a storm and they sort of hold it there and sort of keep some of that water from just joining all the rest of the deluge that's hitting the brooks during a storm. And the question is are we here in a good way or are we here in ways that can be improved? Our watermark is Burlington Bay Market and Cafe. When we took that over and redid the property, it was a super fun cleanup site from a former gas station. Getting the property to the point where none of the petroleum products are actually leaving uh, the site anymore. So a green roof will absorb a lot of that water coming in from storms and reduce that peak flow, but you also have more of a balanced discharge of water out of a green roof. Um, there's been uh, tremendous support um, with, from the Agency of Transportation and working with communities and, and their Better Back Roads program to help some of the rural communities and um, towns around this region to do better practices on their roads. We're sometimes viewed as a polluter. If we were a polluter and we were to stop what we were doing, the environment would be better off. And that's not the case. It's the most important and valuable thing to have in place is to separate our drinking water 
from our wastewater. In places like Haiti and Honduras, that, that just doesn't exist. Where they go to the bathroom is the same place as where they're getting their water from. So if our wastewater system didn't exist, disease would be out of control. The consequence of kind of tightening down on phosphorus limits on wastewater treatment plants is a dramatic reduction in the overall pounds of phosphorus going into the lake. So it's a really great success story. Treatment plants in Vermont do a really good job of removing the vast majority of that phosphorus, and that didn't happen overnight. We're removing nitrogen phosphorus. We screen out heavy materials. Then we let the microorganisms do the work. The balance of that material is clean water that we filter and disinfect prior to recycling it back to the environment. We're at a tipping point with the lake. We're at a tipping point with the EPA right now. Um, this is a huge opportunity and this needs to be a priority. There isn't some magical agency or government group that's going through and cleaning up all this mess for us. And even if we were to wave a wand and solve the phosphorus issue, as long as there's people, there will be pollution. It's our homes, it's our driveways, it's the parking lots we park in when we go to buy our groceries, it's the roads we drive on when we go to work. All of those pieces impact our water resources. If we think that we can clean it up in a year, it's not a realistic goal. Can we improve upon it? Yes, we can. We're not talking years here, we're talking generations. It's going to take the clean lake up. I think everyone is responsible for the sake of their children and their children's children to try to set a principled uh, vision for themselves and for their business to do the right thing. I think the only way we'll be successful is if we're all in. We all benefit and we all stand to lose. Whether you're up on top of the mountain or down on Lake Champlain, that everybody's got to get involved. We are going to have trouble if we are not really vigilant, much more vigilant than we've had to be in the past. The time to debate, the time to do more science, the time to research has long gone by. It's something that we pride ourselves on in our state, so if we don't take care of it, it, it speaks volumes about what we do prioritize. We are voting with our dollar every time we support a local farmer who's choosing sustainable practices that benefit the lake and who's producing food for us that is right here in our own economy. In essence, to eat local, you make your watermark. Just doing a walk around your house and just understanding during a rainstorm where things go can be huge. Getting a rain barrel or planting another tree can do a lot. Best way to manage your rooftop surfaces, making sure that your roof gutter goes to a vegetated area versus having it go directly onto your driveway. So the driveway is often the, the way in which the water from the property ends up getting to the street drainage system and the catch basin which carry the water out to a water body like Lake Champlain or the Winooski River. A lot of people have been experimenting with other ways of doing a driveway that will allow for your driveway to maintain a little bit of the perviousness like the rest of your lawn. This driveway was eroding um, severely. We put in this water bar which is just it's an open top culvert basically um, to direct the water instead of the water channeling the water now goes through the bar. Anything that we put on the ground that we wouldn't want to ingest, we shouldn't be putting on the ground because that's going to eventually get washed into our waterways. Sounds small, but pick up after your pet. In fact, it's a law in Vermont now that uh, you cannot put phosphorus fertilizer on your soil without that kind of a soil test. Conserving water is as much about saving energy as it is about preserving our natural resource. The water we have now is the only water we'll ever have. Just thinking about how much water you use in cooking, how much water you use in the um, bathroom, in the shower, uh, it's rarely as much as you think you need, um, even for something as simple as making pasta. I, I don't flush the toilet every time I use it. I've gone around the house and replaced the shower heads and the sink faucets with water saving devices. And when you multiply out those gallons, uh, the cumulative effect is huge. We can't rely on a few volunteers here and there. Without people sort of having water resources at the, the front of their mind as they're, they're making their decisions, we're, we're not going to get to where we need to be. In Vermont, we have visionaries who are changing the world and they're out there doing it. We were the first 
public university to stop selling bottled water. This was a six, seven year long campaign. I felt really honored to be a part of that. Eventually, we will be emitting zero CO2, emitting zero waste stream, and having like no footprint. Just the beer going up. There's pits here and outside of the building that holds the wastewater. It's then purified through filters and reused in cleaning the next car. And it was important to be good stewards to the environment. Our mission is providing people with a means of clean water in rural, remote regions in developing countries. Hygiene education, sanitation, that's the biggest um, step they can have for a healthier life. You know, that resource represents everything I want my kids to have access to. The importance of the lake could not be overstated. You had recreational fishing derbies. 842 anglers coming from 33 states, and we weighed in nearly uh, 1,900 fish. Underwater dive sites. Cruises by the Lake Champlain Transportation Company. This will be part of our collective legacy, and the time to act is now. It's something that provides life, it has an ecosystem, it has fish, it has champ, <laughs> and all of that needs to be supported. responsibility and work together across the divides that can exist among advocates, businesses, farmers, neighbors, government, who else, to get the job done. Because this one belongs to all of us. I need your support to ensure that the state of Vermont does its part and I look forward to working with you to launch a new era of clean water in Vermont. Mountains are mine.